Hey everyone, welcome to the Regulator Roundtable. I'm Jeremiah DeGenero, Site Manager at Alamance Battleground. In this video series, I'm speaking with authors who have written about the regulator movement during their careers. To find out more from them about how the regulators figure into their own personal story and let them reflect on the legacies of the movement as we commemorate the 250th anniversary of the Battle of Alamance. Even though most of our authors first encountered the regulators while living in North Carolina, this is not the case with everyone. Today, it's my privilege to talk with William Hoagland, a prolific writer on early American history who has published essays on history, music, and politics in the Atlantic Monthly, Salon, the New York Times, Boston Review, the Huffington Post, Lapham's Quarterly, and elsewhere. He was born in Virginia, raised in Brooklyn, and currently resides in New York. He's the author of the narrative history Wild Early Republic Trilogy, The Whiskey Rebellion, Declaration, and Autumn of the Black Snake. His published books also include Founding Finance, which along with his Whiskey Rebellion book, discusses the North Carolina regulation and especially regulator leader Herman Husband. Bill, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah. So you are a little bit of an outlier uh, as a, a non-North Carolinian. Uh, who has uh, a, a, an astounding amount of knowledge about the North Carolina regulation. Uh, a lot of the people that I've talked to, uh, they were uh, PhD students at uh, UNC or at Duke uh, or uh, elsewhere in North Carolina. And usually it was from the, this, uh, from the sense of place of being in North Carolina where they, they get introduced to the regulators. Tell me, how did you first come to hear about the regulators and uh, you know, if you can remember, what would what did you first think about when you heard about them? Yeah, it's a very it's interesting to me to think about because I was for this for this discussion. I've been sort of trying to go back all the way back to when I first might have gotten an inkling about the regulation, and I think I know when it was. I think it was sometime. I mean, I was it was decades ago. I was in my twenties, I think, um, and so and I'm I'm sure I was sitting in an apartment in Brooklyn, New York, reading a book, which is where I find out most of what I find out. Um, and I, uh, this was a book, I can't remember the title. It was not, it was not a book on the regulation. I was completely uninformed about all of this stuff at the time. I didn't even imagine myself sometime in the future writing about the nonfiction about the American past, but I was always fascinated by the development of the West and, and how the West started early in a sense, uh, started East, um, from compared to like the great West and so forth. Uh, and that's because right. well, like when the West was Pennsylvania. Yeah, exactly, exactly, and uh, and sort of the West Sylvania concept and Western Pennsylvania, what is now West Virginia, but was Western Virginia. Anyway, I was reading this book, uh, probably trying to find material for some other kind of uh, project, and I was just like, I, I read about Husband, and it mentioned, and it was about the Whiskey Rebellion was mentioned, and it was sort of like something like Old Herman Husband, formerly known, of course, from the North Carolina regulation where. There was a standoff between, you know, the royal governor and, um, and I was like, I, I had no idea what that was. Um, and so that just fascinated me, just as the idea that there had been well before the revolution, a kind of a democratic uprising against corruption, against oppression, a more, a more sort of egalitarian idea about what America could be, that that, was, that occurred before the revolution, kind of played into the revolution in kind of complicating ways and then comes out the other side and reappears with the same character in both Herman Husband, a leader in the Whiskey Rebellion post-revolution. This just stayed with me um, for years before I ever did anything about looking into it. So I believe that was the first time I ever heard of it and it must have just stuck. Well, it sounds like what, what I'm hearing is that your access point really was Herman Husband, which makes a lot of sense given how uh, prominently he figures in your work um, and how you, you keep returning to him as this very interesting individual in early America. Um, is, would you say he's the, um, the most interesting part of the regulation to you? I guess to me, yes, because he ties the regulation together with the Whiskey Rebellion in, in a, literally in a personal and physical way, like he was there in these two different theaters of conflict one again, that ended up being against the royal governor and another that ended up being against George Washington um, and his, his kind of consistencies and his struggles uh, in opposition to authority tie those two events together for me, but, but beyond tying those two events together, tie together 
the whole idea of a movement of a democratic, a kind of a radically democratic and egalitarian movement that ran into trouble both with, <laughs> with British authority and with American authority, you know. With trouble to put it lightly, yeah. yeah. You're very clear in describing them as a pre-revolutionary, egalitarian, very democratic movement. Uh, of course, our um, challenge at Alamance Battleground is to avoid conflation of the regulation with the revolution. Do you remember when you were first learning about this, um, did, did you kind of see it for what it was or, or did you have to, you know, did you struggle at any point with figuring out, okay, what, what does this have to do and what does it not have to do with the revolution? Yeah, that's been a very interesting journey uh, to me because I guess my I'm, I'm guessing my first understanding of the regulation was kind of like, oh, it's the pre it's a little dress rehearsal for the revolution, you know, um, although very quickly when you start, I mean, even when I first encountered it, looking at husband coming out of uh, the revolution, having been in a, a regulator coming into the whiskey rebellion, it's like, well, wait a second, something's going on here because you know, now they're going up against all the famous founders, all the revolutionary leaders. So what, what's going on here? So I think that that was, that's, I think, probably what most fascinated me, actually, early on. But I didn't really get into exploring that in any kind of detail, probably until, I'm going to say, 2001, 2002, long after I had first heard about it, and I was beginning to look at the Whiskey Rebellion uh, and trying to get background on it. And of course, the regulation is so much is, is its own thing. It's not background on the Whiskey Rebellion either, really. Um, right. So in that sense, it's, you know, no one, no one in the regulation could look ahead and see the revolution, let alone see the Whiskey Rebellion, of course. Um, so then I started reading, I mean, I read Marjolyn Carr's book, of course. I mean, I think that's, I mean, I don't know if things have changed since I was deep into this, but I used to know that book pretty well. And I see it as the book, as the book kind of on, on the subject. That, you know, when it, when it came out, it was such a uh, re-envisioning of the, uh, the regulator movement. Um, and it really was just like, it was like a lightning bolt that just really shook up the historiography. Yeah. And so it, it really, um, to, to this day, it's not the most recent book that was written. I think that distinction goes to uh, Carol Troxler, who's a historian at Elon University. But um, you know that that one breaking loose still has a uh, it casts a long shadow over the historiography of the regulation. Um, and I haven't talked to her yet, but I am going to be talking with Dr. Cars as part of this series, which I'm really looking forward to. Okay, um, cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah breaking but, together, right? I, I think I think that really opened my eyes to certain things, and I haven't I haven't stayed on top of the historiography, obviously, and unfortunately, but I really felt that, that book was a kind of a an explosive, kind of mind blowing way to look at, at things differently from how, you know, when you look at everything in the colonial period and the whole long colonial period as flowing toward American independence and the American Revolution, which is so frequently when I was growing up, how how that long complicated period was taught as if it was all sort of going in one direction. Well, everything has to fit in, right? But when you start to look at these things, they don't really fit in like that because nobody saw the future. Um, and so I think the regulation is fascinating just on that level. And the fact that it was an uprising, not only, I mean, in the end, it was a battle, you know, with, with royal governor and, and, and troops and so forth. So it seems like it could look like a mini revolution. But what's so fascinating is that uh, so much of the of the struggle was against the very East Coast interests, uh, seaboard interests uh, that were actually themselves going up against British government for their own reasons. And it just doesn't shake out the way people want things to shake out in a nice, neat way. And there's all this conflict. And that, that complicates the revolutionary story to me in just a, in a kind of a fascinating way and also kind of a beautiful way. Like it just seems so much more relevant really to our struggles today and ever since the revolution than, than trying to cut and dry it and make it work in that in the kind of way I, way I was just describing. Are, are there uh, recent examples or, or times where you have thought about the regulation as, if not a precursor, as you know, an example of sort of a, a longer American story? Yeah, I have. Um, all the way, all the way to current events, including um, protests, Black Lives Matter protests. I mean, I think there's an obvious connection one might want to draw between recent, because, you know, it's white people, right? Uh, right. So regulations, white people. So you think, oh, well, then the obvious thing might be the Capitol insurrection on January 6th. And of course, there are some things to think about there. 
but I don't see the, the sort of the, the uprising for democracy um, as only, I mean, of course, to those people, it had very limited application. And we should always remember when we talk about it as a democratic movement, I'm always trying to make sure that everyone realizes I'm not saying it was a democratic movement the way we might define a democratic movement nowadays. Uh, um, it, it, was, it was a movement really largely the way I see it for um, sort of free white labor to have a voice in government, which excluded lots and lots of important other people. So, you know, we got we, we to say democracy because that's how they saw it. But of course, it, we also have to qualify that. Um, on the other hand, some of its, its lessons or its, uh, its impulses, some of them could easily be seen as going toward a kind of vigilantism that we might associate with white supremacy uh, later. And some of it might go toward um, extremely uncompromising, extremely risky movements for equality for many other people whom the regulators themselves would not have included. Um, and so again, that's complicated and it doesn't lead to a, a perfect parallel anywhere. But um, I, do, I, do, I do see echoes of the regulation um, in many current and you know, recent and even older events in American history post-regulation. And they're not always looking exactly like the regulation in terms of demographics. You, you spill quite a bit of ink on, on husband. And um, I want to see, you know, do you, um, what is it that interests you the most about him? And um, I think it's safe to say that he's an overlooked figure in American history. Yeah. Why do you think that is? I think he's such an important, you know, early American leader. Uh, and such an important, you know, I've talked in Pennsylvania a lot, such an important Pennsylvanian. In North Carolina, such an important sort of early citizen and leader of that state. I mean, it's just, it's fascinating that he is so overlooked. I think there are a number of reasons because I've thought about it a lot. So, uh, I, 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 you know, I've got some answers, but I don't think they'll ever necessarily resolve the issue. Um, for one thing, I think, I mean, he's overlooked partly because he was a radical who went up against George Washington. And I mean, you'd think that'd be pretty interesting, uh, but it doesn't fit the story of uh, liberty and equality coming out of the revolution. And now we have a democracy and it's all fair play from here on out or some, some very naive story about the revolution. So I think, you know, being involved in the Whiskey Rebellion is a good way to get overlooked uh, in, in, in popular history because, you know, there aren't that many books about it. I've written one of the few for general readers. There aren't that many books about it or, or uh, monographs or dissertations on it uh, by scholars. There are some, and without those, I couldn't have done my work. But um, I, I think that's one reason, is he, he just absolutely complicates the story to the point where you're kind of like, well, this guy was for democracy and equality, and yet he saw George Washington as like a horn of the beast. You know, like, exactly. Well, so, I mean, so he's crazy is one way to look at it. People write him off that way, and people at the time did too, of course. Because the other thing about him that's uh, problematic for many, many readers today and people now is, people now in general, is, um, you know, he was a visionary, not in the metaphoric way that we often use that term. Like Hamilton had a vision for the future of the country, a very important and vaulting and ambitious, ambitious vision. Husband was a visionary like William Blake, uh, the poet and engraver. I mean, he was a visionary like a biblical prophet. He saw or he said he saw, and all we have is, you know, his descriptions of things, but he saw visions of, of, of a kind of, of a kind of a American future that's very hard to process nowadays as a rational plan, uh, because it was so, sort of a revelation, you know, it was, it was for him truly a revelation. So that's hard for people to deal with today. And, and I think that particular fact, the fact that he was essentially having a biblical vision, uh, it, you think his natural allies nowadays, historiographically, would be progressives, progressive historians, um, because he's such a, because there, there is now, of course, a lot of progressive history, and there even was throughout the 20th century, um, criticizing many of the kind of authoritarian and, and elite aspects of the revolution. So why isn't husband then a hero to these people? And I think part of it is that frequently progressivism, progressivism is tied up with a kind of a, rash, a rationalism um, a sense of emphasizing reason, a sense of, you know, being kind of maybe just even embarrassed by discussions of kind of evangelicalism of the kind that husband really came out of and was part of. So now his even his natural allies 
really might not know what to do with him because he's a evangelical Christian visionary with his own sort of almost with his own religion. And so we tend to think of these people potentially as kooks. And um, certainly some of the people of his day did like Hugh Henry Brackenridge thought who met him in, uh, in the context of, of the whiskey rebellion just thought, well, this guy's crazy. We can't, we can't work with him because Brackenridge was a true rationalist type, uh, an enlightenment type. So he goes up again, husband goes up against the enlightenment vision of both the American revolution and egalitarianism. Uh, he's, he's a problem in that sense. The funny thing is that his, his contemporaries among the people of Western North Carolina at the time and Western Pennsylvania later, many of them did not see him as irrational or bizarre. They elected him to office and had him represent them. And he made extraordinarily cogent speeches and arguments both in New Bern, when he was in North Carolina in the capital there and when he was also in the Pennsylvania assembly. All of this stuff that seems so freaky and weird wasn't as weird to many of his sort of working, the people he represented, the sort of working class uh, labor people that he was trying to support. So I think we could remove a little bit of our presentist way, categories about who's crazy and who's not crazy and look at the fact that he actually came up with something that tantamount to a social security pro program uh, in, the, in the 1760s and 70s and 80s. I mean. So you, one way you could say you'd have to be crazy to come up with something like a New Deal kind of structure that early. And in another way, it's pretty impressive. And maybe some of those visions that he was having weren't as crazy as they might have looked to some people at the time or since. Other book, Founding Finance, is one that we also care. You mentioned the, the regulators and um, you uh, look at the American Revolution and that, that time period uh, with a, a totally different um, lens and your topic of interest is finance, money, banking, the things like foreclosures and a debt and you know these issues in the founding period and those I don't really feel like get a lot of attention. Um, why did you feel like it was important to write about that for found, founding finance? Well yeah it's a that's a good question. I mean it's one I've mulled over as well because I feel like there's a there's a bit of a there's resistance to talking about these things the way the way we the words you just use like finance you can just see people public finance or <laughs> credit for closing for closure crises although these are so relevant to everything that we deal with today there is this way when you bring them up in terms of the founding of our country where people are just much generally sort of more excited i found sometimes um, about you know obviously you know liberty equality theories of representation how do they make the senate all of which actually are deeply rooted in warring ideas about public finance. And into an Alexander Hamilton, um, you know, the idea of founding the economic nation is, is founding the nation. To him, you know, uh, 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 that's a nation. That's a, a consolidation of, of economic power combined with a consolidation of military power. What would you want a nation to be? What would a nation mean in, in, in his terms? So there isn't, this, there isn't this distinction between talking about money and finance and so forth and talking about um, the important issues of the founding, but it's hard to sell that to people sometimes, which I find strange because we're, we spend a lot of time in our lives thinking about these matters in our own lives, in our political lives, in our personal lives, um, money, finance, uh, how this is all working, how we're handling it, how we're, how we're not handling it, how it's, how it's not handling us. Um, these are struggles that people go through all the time. Um, but I do think, you know, I mean, I have an agent, my literary agent has told me just don't just don't say finance, put it some other way. And I mean, I know what he means. He means, you know, Hamilton's ambitions for the country, which I'm writing about yet again now in a book specifically on this that I, I find extremely dramatic. I have found Hamilton's efforts in this area and the fights he had and incredibly dramatic. Um, it wasn't about like a dry, dull word like finance. It was about power and greatness and getting big and competing and all that kind of stuff. That's what got him up in the morning and got him out the door was things like that. But to him, that had to do with, with wealth and money and the power of those things. And to his opponents, people like husband, actually, and before the revolution, people like the regulators, um, they too were, were very, very astute about these issues. That's the funny thing. Like, it isn't just that some 
few economic brainiacs uh, with educations on the East Coast were interested in this stuff. I learned really early on in my studies of this from Terry Boughton's, before Terry Boughton had published his book, um, and I'm now on camera, so I'm not going to remember the title because it's different from the title of his dissertation, which I, I read uh, when it was still just in dissertation form when I was first looking into this. I learned early on from him that, I mean, pe ordinary people in the 18th century, it seems, had a far clearer understanding of how some of these financial issues worked to their detriment um, and how they could work to their benefit than many ordinary people seem to want, and even very educated people including a lot of historians who don't seem that interested in this stuff. Many of us have today. Um, and that to me was just fascinating. That's why husbands and neighbors were like, yeah, go, go up there, tell them what we want. You know, we, we want this, we want it. We want access to credit. We want to be able to create structures that benefit ordinary people. That was, that was on the table and it had to do with credit um, and, and fighting foreclosure and getting decent, you know, just getting a decent shake economically which again seems to be very much on the table right now politically in terms of our current debates and so seems highly relevant to me. Um, and yet there, there is this little bump when you start talking like founding finance may not be, you know, the Whiskey Rebellion is an exciting title for a book. Founding finance, I'm not sure it's an exciting title for a book. So I wrote an endless subtitle uh, to try to make it seem exciting. And then they had to cut out a part of that subtitle because it was just too long. Um, so, that, that, that's a, so that's something I struggled with. I didn't realize that subtitle was was at first longer than uh, when longer. the book was published. Even longer. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, it, it kind of kills me that uh, with memory of the, the American Revolution, there is this reliance and over-reliance on taxes as this, you know, rationale for why the, the, the revolution happens. Uh, and it ultimately does a disservice to people like the regulators, and these farmers who um, you know, if you really wanted to understand what they were upset about, you had to understand how credit works, how debt works, how land speculation worked in the 1760s and 1770s. You have to know what, what quit rents are, which I'm, I'm still kind of hazy on. So, yeah, yeah there, there's, there's a lot there, a, a certain financial literacy that was necessary to, to be, you know, uh, in the, uh, the agrarian movement in the 1760s and 1770s. Yeah. I had contacted you. I, I was following you on Twitter, and then, um, especially after January sixth, uh, I started subscribing to your Substack. And um, I was as interested in uh, my pleasure. It's it's great, and I I highly recommend it. We'll, we'll give it a shout out at the end of the um, the interview here. But um, you know, I wanted to to ask you, you know, with with the ability now through social media and through sites like Substack, or you know, if you're into podcasting with Patreon, um, to sort of build your own audience, um, what what sort of opportunities and what new challenges are there for a freelance historian in this new digital world? Yeah, it's really it's. Uh, we'll see what the answer to that is as as we look back later. Right now, we're all kind of in it and trying to figure it out, um, and it's both. People like me, uh, writers uh, who write about history, and it's also um, many scholarly academic historians too are using these platforms to reach new audiences. And it's pretty, it's been, it's been pretty exciting. Um, I think Twitter, which I, you know, I have, you know, I think all of us who use it have some mixed feelings about it. I mean, many of us who use it have mixed feelings about it. And, but I also think it, um, it has been, it's been amazing to have, have public conversation in front of other people interested in the same subject matter um, from, from scholars and writers to readers, all kind of, if, if they're following a few of us at the same time and we start having a debate or a discussion, um, it's this sort of weird new public forum uh, where suddenly like a, a panel discussion can get going and with the right people, it can stay okay. And in fact, be very rewarding and challenging too. Like you, if you have to think on your feet and somebody you really respect is, is coming back at you, well, really, why, you know? And you know that other people are, if they happen to be looking at Twitter at that moment, could be watching. It's this real-time experience that's, I think, new. I mean, I think it is literally new. Um, of course, some of the commentary, because it's social media, can try to drag the thing down to an ad hominem. Uh, so one has to navigate that. But I am, I follow people who are, whom I respect and I'm followed by people whom if they disagree with me, generally respect me. And so 
we've had some pretty interesting discussions and I, and it's great for me because I, my ideas get sharpened in the, in the context of debate, which could spring up kind of out of nowhere in the middle of a work day, which can be a problem for getting work done, real work, <laughs> um, because it's so interesting. So I think, I think social media has been um, double-edged as it is with everything. But I think for me, in terms of building an audience, finding an audience, finding, finding supporters, people, even if they don't agree with me, and finding interesting um, disputants, people who don't really agree with what I'm saying, and help me think out, well, how am I going to say that better? Or, you know, where do I disagree with this person? Or this has been quite exciting, actually. So I think social media has been great for that, for me. For me, it's Twitter, really. I know other people use other things. Um, and so, so that's, uh, in terms of the sort of the Substack newsletter, I jumped into that and everyone's jumping in just to sort of see what I had been blogging on my own blog for years. Um, no subscriber, I mean, followers, but, and then that was great. Then I drifted away from that and was doing kind of long Twitter essays, which I began to find kind of like, okay, this is just a chain of sentences. Like what if I went back to using sentences and paragraphs and did more <laughs> blogging, yes. but then this newsletter thing came along and I thought, well, I'll try that. And it's, it's gotten, I mean, I don't, I don't, I'm not someone Substack is running towards saying, Hey, can we give you a giant advance and, you know, change your life and you'll become, cause I don't have, I didn't come with that kind of journalistic platform. I mean, mostly it's journalists, I think, but it has been great because I have followers on there. I mean, subscribers on there, like you, for example, who, you know, this is the kind of uh, people who are in, engaged in the subject matter who have different come from different places like public history certain journalists who who are really interested in these topics um and so there's a there's a well i'm not exposing myself to the general public on a exposing my work to the general public on a massive scale that way i think i'm i'm getting through to some influential people who are just interested in my take so again i think so far anyway i've only been doing it for some months uh that's been good too yeah, when did you start it actually? The Substack. I think I started in Dece December, I think. Oh, okay. December of okay. 2020. Maybe November. Yeah. So wow. like I had just started it when the January 6th thing happened. And since what I wanted to do with that uh, with that newsletter is kind of try to find the news stuff that's going on, not strain it too much, but try to find the things that are going on in current crises that seem to have some relevance to the past or the past has some relevance to them. Uh, and since I write about insurrection and uprising, um, what, what was going on around the election, I write about, I've written about and studied some of the histories of the parties and elections too. I mean, it was just sort of like, wow, this is a, this is a wild moment. It's a little less wild right now, happily, mm -hmm. um, but we'll see how that, we'll see how that all goes. It's all of the 18th century stuff is in the past and, I, and we read about it. It's not in our face in the same way. And they were, there were certain parallels that were quite striking actually, yeah. in terms of the things, just what riot technique really is and what insurrectionary technique mm -hmm. involves. Um, and I was, you know, I was watching live before it became clear what was going to happen because I was so interested just in the process this year of certifying the vote because I knew there was going to be objection that was going to be sustained by some senators, which is a rare case, uh, very rare. So I just, I was interested in that. I just thought, well, this is going to be something to watch just from a history point of view live. And then seeing what was happening, and I just thought, oh, oh no. And then I didn't think they'd get in, of course. But just like some of the rioters of the 18th century, they got in and did all, all many of the things that are the rioters you and I know about used to do. There's something fundamental about these tactics and something fundamental about the mood um, mm -hmm. involved. One thing that occurred to me was that, you know, a lot of the regulators and whiskey rebels too, uh, were people who had been denied basically uh, democratic access to having their voices heard in government, like basically denied the vote without sufficient property and certainly denied the, right, the power to stand for office without sufficient property and so forth. And so there's a, there's, I mean, we, we can't probably do all the nuances of this now, but it's very interesting to try to compare, uh, you know, there's no, there's never going to be a one-to-one -one distinction or parallel, but um, you know it's interesting that the 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 people who were creating the insurrection had had powers and rights and the, to exercise uh, in a legitimate way that the many of the regulators and many of the whiskey rebels did not have at the time. Uh, 
uh, as we were afforded this moment 250 years on to consider the regulators and the work of, of Herman Husband, what lessons and anything that you haven't covered or if you want to, to circle back, you can. Um, what lessons does this story have for us and for the general public today? Well, that's a really big one because I think it's, you know, it's very hard as you, just, you, know, you just did the disclaimer. It's, it's really hard to, to draw one-to-one uh, -one lessons um, because times are so different. On the other hand, these, these things keep happening. Um, and also on the other hand, the values that were being discussed during the regulation, um, the values that were being sort of argued for by husband you know, in New Bern and, uh, and by the regulator pamphlets and so forth. And all of that are values that we're still arguing about. And they have to do with, and while the regulators were certainly not uh, looking for what we would think of as widespread democracy today, they were trying to do something radical, which was begin to break the connection that had been so, so important to the whole idea of rights for so long, um, especially voting rights going all the way back to, you know, who, who gets to vote? Well, people with property, because that's who has skin in the game. That was, that's the, that was the old idea. Breaking that, questioning that connection, breaking that connection, which the levelers had done back in England and others, but really here in the United States, um, before the United States, and then during, and then after and up to now, the whole question of like, who really gets to be a citizen and what kind of economic um, profile are you supposed to have, and how does that get? How does that right to vote get suppressed? Um, and how does it? How do, how do they try to put up barriers to voting? Because back then, even when back in the regulation times, say, and 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 even later during the whiskey rebellion or leading up to the whiskey rebellion, I mean, it wasn't just some people had the right to vote or the power to vote, but there were many many other barriers that were placed between the person and the and the election booth you know, or whatever they had then, you know, just coming in and saying who you wanted. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you know, days of days of travel, um, you know, greater, greater, more votes for certain better off counties. I mean, failure to create new counties, even when the populations were there to support it. All of those tactics were essentially voter suppression tactics. And of course, the fight to get the vote widely for everybody uh, has been a long American struggle. And there's been a long American struggle that goes back to before the revolution. And it's not a British versus American struggle. It's an American versus American struggle uh, to suppress the vote and keep people from voting. And that I think, I don't think there's a lesson there exactly, but I think there's extraordinary resonance and relevance for conversations we're having today about what voting is and how it should run and what it's for and so forth. So that's kind of where I come away from looking at the times like the regulations, like the regulation. Yeah. Well, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, it's been great to talk with you. And um, you can follow uh, William Hoagland on Twitter. His handle is at William Hoagland, H-O-G-E-L-A-N-D. And for a small subscription fee, you can receive longer form writing in his uh, Substack newsletter twice a month, at least twice a month, right, right Bill? That, that's right. All right, uh, from Hoagland's Bad History uh, on Substack at williamhoagland.substack.com. Uh, you can also find his books, The Whiskey Rebellion and Founding Finance, available through the gift shop at Alamance Battleground State Historic Site. Bill, thank you so much, really enjoyed it. Oh, me too, thank you, Jeremiah, it's been great.